Hello friends! On this YouTube channel I have documented a lot of the projects that I've been working on over the past 11 years. Many of the viewers who have joined the audience over the past 5 of those years will probably have gotten to know the channel as being mainly focused on repair jobs. And while that is and will be a major part of my activities, I also just needed that scrappy attitude to build and upgrade my workshop to be able to fabricate and manufacture more sophisticated parts and objects in it. I always wanted to build cool things and potentially in numbers. And to make that possible, last year alone I built several compressors, repaired two plasma cutters and built a CNC table for them. I also built a CNC milling machine, acquired a better TIG welder, built a magnetic drilling machine, purchased a conventional milling machine and upgraded my drill press and built a gantry and the list goes on. In the coming months these machines will be employed more and more to produce objects in line with earlier retro futuristic design projects of mine that I have presented on this channel in the past. It's been a few years but you might remember my computer console, also various lamps that I built over the years as well as wall decorations and stuff like that. The actual designs that I'm currently working on are still something of a secret and will only be revealed step by step in the future. These projects are way past the concept stage though and are well on the way to being on sale in certain numbers later this year. More about that in the future. But on a similar note, one kind of object that has always fascinated me are vintage aluminium storage containers, some of which I have found on scrapyards in the past. A small shop like mine lacks the capabilities to make something just like that. However, I'm currently investing a lot of time learning about sheet metal forming in the hope of one day being able to make objects that are at least inspired by the forms and shapes of these industrially made containers and boxes. But in parallel to my efforts in the realm of sheet metal forming, I came up with some designs and mock-ups for smaller aluminium containers, buckets, boxes and chests that I would like to make from cast aluminium instead. The objects you see here are 3D printed models that I spray painted with a silverish color so that they would resemble objects made from aluminium. I actually came up with a variety of similar designs, many of which I haven't even printed yet. They only really exist in my head or on the computer. In the last video I already made this simple bucket shape casting here. And while I would like to cast round shapes like this one here sooner or later, for now we will try to make a polygonal piece that you can also find in a slightly more complex form in this design here. In this episode I will try to create a casting resembling this 3D printed pattern here. In the last episode I had modified this old furnace here and had equipped it with a modern temperature controller. I then also made these two molds from steel, one of which also doubles as a crucible that pretty much maxes out the available volume inside this furnace. Now I really like it a lot, it heats up rather quickly, runs on single phase AC which is here powered by an off grid solar array and you can make aluminium castings of up to 3.5 kilograms in weight which is quite a lot for what I'm doing here. So while that is really enough for the castings that I'm currently working on here, it has one major drawback. I have collected a lot of aluminium scrap over the years that I want to use for casting, but many of the pieces of scrap are way too big for this small furnace. For that and also to make bigger casting jobs possible in the future I have now bought a much bigger and much more expensive pottery kiln. This kiln was made in 1980 by the German company Nabatam, known for making various types of professional pottery kilns and furnaces to this day. This model will allow me to melt down much larger pieces of scrap than before while at a power rating of 3.2 kilowatts it still runs on a normal outlet. It can reach temperatures of up to 1200 degrees celsius but it would take hours to reach that temperature even when totally empty. It can easily reach the 650 to 800 degrees C temperature range that we will need it for though. 
It's fully operational, but was stored in a basement and getting it up the stairs was a nightmare. And that was only possible in the first place because one of you guys lent me a hand. Thank you again for that. You know who you are. And in order to get it through a door frame in that house, I had to detach the temperature controller, which I'm now screwing back on. For the time being, this rather heavy piece of equipment has found a place outside covered from five sides by this wooden structure that I normally use to store wood. So it obviously has a lot more space inside than the other furnace. But we can't just melt down metal scrap in there without catching the molten metal in a pan or crucible of some sort. And that's why the next task, after taking measurements, was to construct a crucible that would make it possible to make good use of the available room inside the kiln. Now the typical graphite and ceramic crucibles you can often see in metal casting are typically cylindrical or round in shape. But in order to use the available box shaped space inside the kiln optimally, we will now make a steel pan with a rectangular footprint instead. So after taking some measurements of the available space, I drew the parts needed to make such a pan from steel sheets in a CAD program and generated a toolpath for my CNC plasma cutter to cut out the parts needed. The CNC plasma cutter has now been certainly proven to be one of the most useful machines that I ever built here. It's a joy for me to see it go every time. But since the steel sheets that I'm using here are usually from a scrap, there's always some amount of rust on them that needs to be ground off. But since plasma cutting often leaves a certain amount of dross or slag behind, it's almost always necessary anyway to clean up the parts after cutting. And before I could weld the parts together, I needed to align them and create at least a few tack welds so they wouldn't fall apart. This turned out to be rather finicky. In the end, I needed to use a ratchet strap to force the different sections into alignment. Eventually, I started to weld actual seams alongside all edges and I did that first on the inside and then on the outside of the pen. The purpose of the trapezoidal or slanted form is that in case metal would cool down and solidify inside the pan, you would have a better chance to remove it from the pan as opposed to just having a box shaped form with non slanted walls. In terms of pouring molten metal, a rectangular shape like this is not ideal. So in order to prevent molten aluminum from just flowing over the walls of the pan, I added a spout and also these parts on top that will prevent spillage and kind of guide the metal to the spout. I also cut out two more parts with a plasma cutter and welded them to the crucible as well. Their purpose is to attach a handle to the pan and also potentially hook the crucible up to chains. With all this done, it was time to heat up the kiln and test the new setup. The specific alloy that was used for these extrusions is most probably not ideal for aluminum casting, but it will be good enough for simple experiments like this. So after loading the scrap into the kiln and turning it on, we measure 535 degrees after an hour and 15 minutes. And after two more hours, the oven is at almost 740 degrees and the aluminum should be in molten state now. So let's have a look inside. The idea now is to pour the aluminum into the smaller crucible slash mold that we made in the last video. This way we can get an ingot that we can then reheat much easier and quicker in the smaller furnace to do actual castings at a later point in time. But for that we first need to make a mold for that polygonal shape that I want to cast. Okay, so I have decided to try to cast this shape here in aluminium. This is only an intermediate step in researching if my method of approaching this is any good. Now the traditional way is to make molds from sand casting. But what is annoying about that process is that the mold is basically destroyed after each casting and that makes it very cumbersome to use if you want to cast a specific shape in numbers. That's why I'm trying to make molds from steel. One way to do that would be to mill out the required shape on the milling machine from a massive block of steel or cast iron for example. 
and I will probably try that soon. But for now, I want to find out if I can leverage my CNC plasma cutter for this purpose as well. So in order to accomplish that, I designed two shapes to craft two three-dimensional polygonal molds that fit into each other, with the open space between them having the shape of our 3D printed pattern. And after cutting out these 10 different pieces here with the plasma cutter and cleaning them up, I manually measured and scribed lines onto the steel. This is where the parts needed to be bent to form a three-dimensional shape. In order to accomplish something like this, 3D modeling on a computer is of huge help. Another old school approach that I would have otherwise taken is to make a model from cardboard first. Making something like this from nothing but a drawing and some calculations is possible, but leaves a lot of room to make errors along the way. Believe me, I've done this before. Those errors would potentially cost a lot of time in an already very lengthy process. After scribing all the parts carefully, I use an angle grinder to cut grooves where the metal needs to be bent. This is probably the most imprecise step in the entire process. Luckily, I have many years of experience in handling angle grinders and that helps with a steady hand. The grooves must be deep enough to allow the metal to be bent by hand, but not so deep that the steel will easily break while bending it. In this case, I could have cut some of the grooves a little deeper. Each of the two molds could have been made from a single piece of steel, by the way. But I made them from five pieces each, because this way it is easier for me to clamp the sheets into a vise and bend the parts precisely. The smaller parts will be welded to the bigger parts in just a minute. Overall, this worked out pretty well, but it also shows one weakness of the plasma cutter method. Even under ideal conditions, the cuts that I can make here are about two to three millimeters wide, and it's not possible to completely compensate for the material that you lose that way. We will have to fill those gaps up by welding over them. So back inside the workshop, I then proceeded to weld the outer mold first. The big central piece was tack welded in many places and the smaller parts were inserted. before I then proceeded to weld actual seams and this happened again from the inside as well as from the outside. After finishing that job on the outer mold, the process was repeated with the inner mold as well. And after waiting for them to cool down, the molds needed to be cleaned up, at least on those surfaces, where they will actually have contact with the molten aluminium. With the outer form, that means the inside needs to be ground smooth and I did that with an air-powered grinder. I can't get a perfect result this way, but my goal was to grind a little too deep so that the cast part would later have a little too much material around the corners so that the casting could then be ground down to the exact geometry afterwards. In case of the inner form, it is the outside that will touch the molten aluminium and that's why we need to grind down the welds on the outside. I could get a much better result if I had a good belt or table sander, but I just don't. Arguably a very important machine in a metal shop and I feel ashamed for not having one. I should probably change that soon and I think I will, but I just don't know yet how much money I can spend on that right now and where to put that machine in the shop. Anyway, in the next step I also added these handles and spacers to the smaller molds so that it wouldn't just fall into the larger one when placed on top of it. They are only tacked to the mold temporarily and hastily, since I'm pretty sure that I will remove them again soon and come up with a better solution for this. This is really only good for the first few tests. And for these following tests, I sifted through my pile of aluminium scrap and only picked the parts that were actually made from cast aluminium in the first place and loaded them into the kiln. And once again, after melting them down, I poured the molten metal into the smaller crucible for reheating in the smaller furnace. Looking at the footage, I really need to get that cable out of the way though. Now, let's see if this method works.
as you can see, I was way too slow here and we have to do this all over again. Second attempt. And it was again necessary here to pour cold water into the inner mold, then pour it out again quickly to shrink the inner mold and then take it out of the casting. As expected, the top part of the casting is very uneven, but I knew that that would happen and that's why the mold is actually two centimeters or so taller than the actual casting I want to make. To create a nice even top side of the casting, the milling machine is then employed once again. And here you can see the first somewhat successful casting right next to the 3D printed pattern. Once I have a belt sander, I will try to grind the outside surfaces down somewhat to get a more defined geometry. What I really have to work on is a better method to quickly and precisely insert the smaller mold into the larger one. Other than that, I think this could work. If you like my videos, then I would ask you to give this video a like. It would really mean a lot to me. And I would like to make quick progress with these casting experiments. But in reality, I can't really do all that much about it right now because I was just released from hospital, recovering from surgery. What has happened to me? Well, a few months ago, I was hauling this huge pile of firewood to the workshop all by myself. The wood was stored in huge boxes that I idiotically decided to lift and handle all by myself. If I had just waited another day or so, I could have had someone here to help me with it, but I didn't, I rushed it. And the next morning I woke up and saw that I had developed a hernia and those don't heal by themselves, you have to get surgery. So that is exactly what happened just a few days ago and I'm now sitting at home recovering from that. And this will mean that I won't be able to do any heavy lifting or hard physical labor for a couple of weeks to come. Luckily I have worked on so many things over the past months that I have tons of video footage on the computer that I still want to show you. So just like I do as we speak, I will simply keep doing video editing on my computer until I have recovered. Among those things is the second Australia video that I still need to publish. It will probably still be a hard time for me though, to be completely honest, since there are so many things that I can't work on. And in the meantime, as a self-employed person, this will also mean a financial setback for me. So in case you want to help with future video production, you can make a donation, a link for that is under the video, or you can become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon.